Hello and welcome to the election show on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer. I'm an associate professor of political science at Fordham University and the co-host of the FAQ NYC podcast. Joining me today, as always, via Zoom, are Matt McDermott, who's a communication strategist and vice president of Whitman Insight Strategies, and also with me is political analyst and professor of political science at Columbia University, Lincoln Mitchell. Hello, gentlemen. Good, Good to be with you. you. Nice to see you both. Uh, Happy post-election day. Thank you. So I thought for this episode, we would talk about so two things. One, I wanted us to go over uh, the New York primaries. Uh, and we don't have all the results just yet, uh, but there have been some interesting developments. And then I wanted to shift a little bit more to national politics and talk about the president and how he's dealing with the COVID crisis and the global pandemic and how that affects his election chances in November. I know it's pretty early, but uh, we, we are seeing some some quite troubling uh, policy decisions that are coming out of Washington. I want to get your insights on that. So let's start, uh, let's start with District 9. I thought we'd talk about 9, 12, 15, and 16. So for those of you who are watching at home, District 9 is Brooklyn, uh, held by incumbent Yvette Clark. And as of now, it looks like she's going to hold on to uh, her seat. Uh, two years ago, Adem uh, Badenko, who was sort of a young upstart, uh, Ugandan American uh, challenged her and came pretty close. If you all remember, uh, Yvette Clark, Carolyn Maloney, and uh, Joe Crowley uh, all had pretty tight uh, primary <laughs> challenges. And we know that um, um, Joe Crowley uh, was ousted by AOC and she handedly won re-election this term. Uh, but there was always a question as to whether Adem Badenko and Suraj Patel who challenged uh, uh, Representative Maloney, whether or not they'd run again and how they would do. Well, we've seen that they ran again in crowded primary fields. There are lots more people who came in. Uh, and it seems that Adem Badenko is not going to be victorious, but uh, Siraj Patel just might be able to pull it out. There's some different dynamics in both of those districts. So let's start with Brooklyn. Um, Matt, I'll start with you. Why do you think that uh, Yvette Clark won so handedly, at, at least for now? Uh, we still have pretty, uh, quite a few absentee ballots to count. We know that absentee ballots, uh, roughly 700,000 were mailed out to New Yorkers. As of now, it looks like uh, Yvette Clark will be going back to Washington, D.C., uh, not just in November, but when she's re-sworn in in January. What do you think changed from 2018 to 2020? And let me say, uh, first in full disclosure, uh, I, I worked on Siraj Patel's campaign, so have, have that in mind. But I think both in Clark's district, Maloney's district, Engel's district, to some extent in, in Jerry Nadler's district, um, there's really two dynamics in play here. On one hand, uh, I think after Joe Crowley lost to AOC last cycle, uh, there was a real awakening in the Democratic establishment in New York that there were races that were ripe for challengers. And if you were a multi decade incumbent in the city of New York, you needed to do a lot after 2018 to shore up your base of support um, and ultimately win your election uh, this week. And some of the candidates did that, others did not. I think Yvette Clark is one that recognized the challenge uh, that she had in this cycle and so has done a fairly significant amount of work shoring up her bases of support in that district since 2018 so that she wasn't caught off guard again. I think what you saw, though, broadly in all of these races is this dynamic of change versus status quo. And I think we've always known that this was going to be a change election cycle. I think most people expected that change to happen in November with obviously the ousting of Donald Trump. But what I think you see happening with large swaths of the Democratic electorate is a number of voters saying, look, we obviously need to make a change at the presidential election with Donald Trump next year. Um, but given the fact that, that we want to get him out, more needs to be done to ensure that we have a Democratic Congress that's actually working for us as well. And there wants to be a changing of the guard at that level. And so I think really the, the dynamic that's existed across all of these races is a number of these members of Congress have been around for decades. They ran on their experience. They ran on their seniority. They ran on this idea that as a multi-decade incumbent, you can bring home the bacon to your district. And what you saw across these districts is voters saying, if all of this is true, where's the bacon? What, what is my member of Congress doing for me 
that a younger, more dynamic candidate couldn't do because they're looking at races like AOC's in 2018 and saying, she's doing a pretty good job and she has a national presence for herself. Why doesn't Carolyn Maloney have that presence? Why doesn't Elliot Engel have that presence? And so I think there's just a, a fundamental case for change that was made by these outside candidates and you can see the effect of that on the electorate this week. So uh, Lincoln, I mean, because I, I definitely want to talk about Clark's race. Let's just take Clark and Maloney right now, because those are the two races that seemed a little similar from 2018 to 2020. Now, Lincoln, we know, though, that Carolyn Maloney's district represents not just parts of the east side of Manhattan, but also Queens. And so because of the COVID crisis, many people are saying that uh, Carolyn Maloney suffered from quite a few people uh, not being actually physically in the district, and maybe they did not uh, fill out their absentee ballots. It's still too soon to tell whether or not she'll lose her seat. But do you, do you follow that, that line of thinking, or do you think it was something else, uh, or in addition to uh, possibly her losing some of her base? The, the COVID crisis raises all kinds of questions for voting in general. To say it helps one primary candidate more than another I'm not sure I'm convinced that. It introduces an element of uncertainty. And if you're the underdog, uncertainty is always good because if you're the front runner, you want certainty so you can you know, put that win in the bank. They're not done counting all the ballots. In all disclosure, I don't have a horse in this race. I don't live in this district. I, when I lived in the Upper East Side you know, many years ago, I think I voted for Maloney the first time so she could get in there, but I don't have a horse in that race. But there are, you know, there are affluent people on the Upper East Side. I mean, if you've spent, I've only rid, like ran through there on a run once or twice. I live on the West Side who aren't there because they've gone to their second homes. But those people presumably know how to do a mail-in ballot. Now, whether they think it's important enough to do it is a different question, right? And I think that's where, you know, you can get in a, there are, there are EDs, election districts within that congressional district where you know Maloney's gonna do well and you can go there on election day and do the work and pull out the vote. And it's harder to do that in this COVID climate. So that may have hurt her a little bit, but I don't wanna say this is a COVID defeat. That seems to, to underestimate what Patel has accomplished in knocking someone off who's been there since 92 and is not a star in the sense of a national profile. But she's also, she's also no scandal or anything. I just want to very quickly, AOC obviously got reelected easily, but she was the one who won in 2018 and a lot of money went into defeating her. And, you know, it may seem too obvious to state, but I think we should state it anyway. In a lower income district, um, a candidate who works hard to help lower income people got reelected. That's not news, but some people doubted that would happen. And she won by a much bigger margin than I think some of her critics expected. Right. Well, I want to stick with that logic because let's jump to the New York 16th. And that's, uh, Matt mentioned, it was Elliot Engel's district. Elliot Engel had been a, a, a member of Congress for 16 terms, uh, a young, <laughs> I'm in my 40s now, so I will say a young uh, <laughs> challenger, uh, Jamal <laughs> Bowman, who's uh, 44, I believe, uh, African-American, challenged Congressman Engel. Um, not only did he win, uh, he has a pretty decisive win. I mean, none of the elections are certified just yet, but he got over 60% of the vote. His argument, uh, especially in his uh, acceptance or his, his acceptance speech uh, Tuesday evening was essentially, uh, I'm gonna go to DC and cause trouble, but I'm gonna ca cause the good kind of trouble uh, on behalf of poor people in this district. Uh, there's no excuse for us to not have especially having had a congressman in Washington, D.C. for over 30 years. We also know that Congressman Engel uh, was caught on a hot microphone, uh, essentially saying, if I didn't have a primary challenge, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> be here. Uh, so that may have contributed to it. Um, but we do know that he's also the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And so some people, some pundits, were really questioning whether or not uh, Jamal Bowman would be able to win, because as, as Matt, you alluded to, um, you know, during times of crisis, many voters like stability. They like the status quo. And the argument was made, Democrats, especially New York Democrats, have quite a bit of seniority. We've seen Jerry Nadler heading up uh, Trump's impeachment trial. Uh, and so we've seen different players emerging. Obviously, Hakeem Jeffries is a rising star as well. And so uh, the logic was stick with Angle. He's got seniority. Uh, and, and stay with the status quo in a time of, of confusion and uncertainty and unrest. And clearly his district decided to go in a different direction. Uh, what do you make of that, Matt? So there's a dynamic that was true before coronavirus, and then there's a dynamic that's happened since coronavirus, both of which I, I think have affected a lot of these races, including Engels. One is that 
for a long time now, uh, the incumbents in New York City have made the case that they are progressive voices in Washington. That has been called to question now repeatedly over the past few years. You have people like Elliot Engel, Carolyn Maloney as well, both who voted against the Iran deal, both who admittedly two decades ago voted for the Iraq war. And so you have a hawkish, particularly on foreign policy, a hawkish delegation from New York City that has not reflected the voices of the voters in their districts for a while. Under Trump, that has been uh, a particular problem because you essentially have a democratic, democratic delegation out of New York essentially standing with Donald Trump on issues like Iran policy, uh, which is completely out of whack with where pro progressive voters are today. The other dynamic is sort of the post-COVID dynamic, which you mentioned, um, Elliot Engel in particular, who has not been particularly attuned to the needs of his district, essentially helicoptering in two weeks before the election and getting caught on a hot mic saying that, you know, he deserves to have a voice at, at the microphone, you know, so he can address issues uh, that are important to voters. Uh, not great. Uh, but Carolyn Maloney also had a post-COVID situation in which for a number of years, she elevated anti-vax voices in Washington. And so her opponents made a huge issue of that, making the case that in this time in which we literally have a conspiracy theorist in the White House, we don't need Democrats in Congress hawking those same points. And so she was held accountable for years of anti-vax language that she used, didn't have a very good response for it. And it was the number one issue that drove votes in that district. So sort of nuanced dynamics between both of them. But I, I think what we can say for sure is that coronavirus and the subsequent uh, uh, situation, both through the lens of public health and economically, have had a huge impact on this electorate. I think that the hypothesis of the conventional wisdom was that it would lead people to stick with stability. Instead, I think what we've seen is a lot of voters say, you know what, enough is enough, we need to clear house, and we need new leadership both in the White House with Joe Biden and a new fresh voice and perspective for Democrats in Congress. Mm -hmm. Lincoln, I mean, building off of what Matt just said, you know, what else, what other dynamics in the Bowman angle matchup uh, were of interest to you? Well, if you are chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House, that draws in a lot of national money, right, from different groups. It draws in a lot of attention in Washington. A lot of people want to talk to you. You are in integrated into the foreign policy of the United States in a different way than an ordinary member of Congress, but it doesn't do anything for the people in your district, right? The people in your district, and I'm not picking on Elliot Engel here, regardless of who we're talking about, they, they might have some abstract status. You're not solving their problems. And the challenge of that job is that foreign affairs stuff is fun. People get pulled into it, they do it. I mean, I had a diplomat from a former Soviet country who you know, tweeted a guy I'm very close with, you know. In L.A. Angle, we had one of the few people who really understood this part of the world in Congress. Well, that's important for that diplomat. It's not important for the people in his district. And Engel has been there for a long, he got elected in 1988 the first time, right? That is, that's longer than Maloney and Nadler got there in 92 even, right? And that district has changed. Nadler's district has changed a lot, but not in a way that's, that's harmful to Jerry Nadler politically. The demographic changes there don't matter quite as much. And the other thing is that Jerry Nadler, who you know, as he is chair of the Judicial Committee, but of the two members of Congress in the House who were really most visible in the impeachment hearings, it's clear that he was the second most impressive. He's no Adam Schiff, right? But at least, but at least he is visible on impeachment. So Nadler is branded as part of the resistance. Angle and Maloney are not. And I would say this, if you are a voter in that district and you vote for Bauman in the primary and Biden in the general election, those are politically and intellectually consistent things to do. So there's, there's room to do both. They didn't, they didn't want such a change that they voted Republican. And we haven't touched on it, but there was another district where there was a MAGA guy running and he uh, lost badly, I'm happy to report. Right, well, let's shift to national, national politics. I'm still chuckling because when you said Engel was elected in 1988, 80. I saw Matt smile. And I won't ask how old Matt was in 1988, but something tells me he was not paying attention to politics or voting during that I'm, time. Or, or alive, but not <laughs> for another day. I'm old enough to attend Yankee playoff games with Elliot Engel in the 90s. 
So yes, yeah, so, so that that just to give it some context, right? I mean, the head of, of Whitman Insight Strategies was not alive when Elliot Engel went to. Now Washington. you're making me feel even older. So maybe we'll stop this. <laughs> um, I won't. I won't say how old I was, but I was not voting. I was just. I was, I was older than Valley High. I and I voted for Michael that. Dukakis in that election. So let's let's go to Washington D.C. Obviously, lots of folks are asking me, you know. Is Biden going to be able to do it? And my response right now has been like, it's it's very early. Um, it's, you know, yes, we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Yes, we are on Zoom because we can't be together uh, because of the, the way the Republican Party and, and the president explicitly have handled this crisis. But many people have also expressed a fresh, these are Democratic voters, have expressed a frustration with me, um, essentially feeling like Obama has been out there sort of making statements and sort of talking about uh, how important uh, it is to sort of get the coronavirus under control. Um, and they're, they're feeling as though Joe Biden has been absent and essentially, as the president brands him, you know, hiding out in his basement. And so Matt, uh, I've, I've asked you this a, a, a myriad of times in different ways because each time we get closer and closer to the election. But having had our New York City primaries um, last Tuesday, what should Joe Biden be doing this summer to make Democratic voters feel like he's he's actually in the race, right? And and you've said before, you know, maybe a silent strategy could work and just kind of let the president tucker himself out with his sad rallies and, and his rants. Um, maybe it's a, a VP pick that will energize uh, the Democratic base and, and get people back into the race. Uh, maybe less is more because we know he's gaff prone. But you know, it's now late June and you've got Democrats feeling like their candidate isn't around. So what would you suggest he do? And sort of what would you tell Democratic voters to expect? You know, it's a realistic expectation for them in this moment. And to bring our previous conversation into this one, I actually think that's part of why you're seeing what you're seeing in these congressional races, is you have voters on the Democratic side essentially saying, the stability we seek is gonna be with Joe Biden in the presidency. We appreciate that he's not a dynamic person. Let's get some people into Congress who are, who can lead that conversation. So actually, I think that's part of why you're seeing what you're seeing mm -hmm. is if we're not gonna have that dynamic voice in the White House next year, a lot of voters wanna have that dynamic voice in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and so and I, I think- Push him to the left even more when correct. necessary. Mm -hmm. Correct, because I, I I think there's a realization among voters on the left uh, that there is a substantial amount that needs to be done the second we get Donald Trump out of the White House. It's looking increasingly likely that he'll have a friendly voice in Congress. And so I think a lot of voters want to ensure that that's a friendly progressive voice and that it's a friendly progressive voice that's going to push a series of legislative items that actually speak to progressive voters uh, in a lot of these districts. In terms of what Joe Biden needs to do, I, I think you're slowly seeing this week a campaign come to life. He, after Donald Trump held uh, a, a pretty unfortunate uh, and, and lackluster campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma last week, held a fundraiser this week with Barack Obama that brought in $11 million, had hundreds of thousands of people join that small dollar donors and activists around the country. I think that sort of mobilization effort is, is what you're gonna start seeing unfold is getting volunteers back into the fold, getting the voices of our party back into the fold and energizing them heading into the election. Because to your point exactly, the only thing energizing voters right now is do you like or do you hate Donald Trump? And for better or worse, that is the reality that's gonna exist through November. But I think more and more Democrats, including the Biden campaign, recognize that after this election, there's a substantial amount of work that needs to be done and we need to start thinking right now about what that plan looks like to ensure that we're not wasting time come uh, the last week of January next year. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln, I mean, going, building off of Matt's point, you know, we, we can't forget, we always call him Vice President Joe Biden, but he was in the Senate uh, for several decades. And so the relationships that if he is victorious in November, he's walking into uh, someone who understands uh, how governance works especially understands the relationship between the executive and the legislative branches. And so uh, possibly this, this diversity of blue that we see amongst the Democrats uh, will, you know, we're, we're blue, but there's a lot, there are a lot of different shades. Um, 
bodes well for Biden to be able to negotiate that. I mean, what do you think he should be doing uh, to prepare himself uh, for November 3rd? Well, Joe Biden is smart enough to know that if the Democrats, Democrats in the House and the Senate put legislation on his desk, he needs to sign it. And that's very, very important because he's not gonna play this game of, I want the economic stimulus bill to look my way. He's gonna know that if Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer gets a majority, they iron it out, he's gonna sign that into law. So that's big. The thing that I think he needs to focus on is uh, transitional justice, right? A Biden election is a victory for the Democratic Party, obviously, but is also a restoration of small d democracy in the United States. And this question of what do you do about a semi-authoritarian criminal regime, right? But if you throw Donald Trump in jail, regardless of the judicial, the law, you know, even if you can prove that he's a criminal, that sets a precedent where inevitably Joe Biden will get, you know, threatened with jail time after he leaves office. But if you don't throw anyone in jail, then you're saying criminality is okay. Those are really complicated issues. I'm a political scientist, not a lawyer, so I'm looking from one perspective. But that's something he needs to be thinking about and his team needs to be thinking about. And for me, that's that should be taking up at least as much of the president's time as what should the economic stimulus be, because basically, the, the House Democrats will figure that out. Um, the other thing I would add is that we're four and a half months away from the election now. And it seems like a long time, but at the risk of sounding like Yogi Berra, elections get late early. And, and four and a half months being down this far, if you are an incumbent, right, you can reshape perceptions if you're a challenger because you haven't had you know, the convention, the big speech, the flood of TV at the end. But for an incumbent, these numbers, they're, they're more sticky than they would be if this were a race for an open seat. So whereas I generally agree that Biden has to get out there and do something, doesn't have to rush out there. And also, if COVID gets bad again in October, and he really says, I really do have to be in my basement now because it's that serious, then he will have kind of finagled this, right? He waited, he pushed this back to July. He, he didn't have to, so, because it is true that Biden's strength is his temperament and his character and not his you know ability as a great speaker on the stump or anything like that. Right. Yeah, I mean, let me, I was just gonna, I was just gonna add to that. To me, the most important success metric for a president is who you hire, who you put in your cabinet, who you fill out senior levels of, of, of your cabinet and, and elsewhere uh, across our federal government. And so while it's not sexy to talk about, and it doesn't, you know, mobilize voters, the single most important thing Joe Biden and his campaign can be doing right now is putting together an assessment of who am I filling out my government with? Because to Lincoln's point, this is a transition presidency. Joe Biden himself has talked about this. Joe Biden is not the future of this party. The future of this party is going to be determined by who Joe Biden brings with him into government. And so from the vice president on down to the cabinet, down into who he staffs that government with is the most important thing that Joe Biden is going to do after the November election. And so, you know, would I love Joe Biden to be, you know, out there on national TV every day more? Maybe, honestly, maybe not. But the single greatest important thing he could be doing right now is sitting inside with his advisors and figuring out who is going to staff this government assuming he wins election. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we've talked about that quite a bit with his selection of the VP and how this is the first time where a VP pick is really, really important and sort of sends a, a clear message as to what type of presidency we'll have. I mean, Joe Biden is 77. So going to Lincoln's point, uh, you know, with the COVID crisis, he does have to be very careful just because he is in a, in a more dangerous bracket. But also his selection, uh, many people have said, you know, he should speak uh, more, um, feverishly about who he would want to nominate uh, on a Supreme Court or who he would want to nominate uh, as cabinet positions beforehand. Um, you know, you don't want to be accused of measuring the drapes before you move into the Oval Office. However, just signaling what type of Democrats uh, would be in a, in a Biden administration, especially because as we saw on Tuesday evening, the diversity within the Democratic Party is quite large. Uh, you have many people who are centrist, uh, many voters who want status quo. And then you've got uh, hardcore progressives who are very happy with candidates who have zero uh, electoral experience um, because they want some new ideas and new blood. And then we have sort of more pragmatic progressives who have been within the institutional systems uh, and electoral politics in, in their 
uh, they understand compromise uh, and coalition building in, in a very different way. So knowing that, uh, the last few minutes before I let you all go, uh, we, we saw the president sort of start his campaign season. We know that he started fundraising the, the moment he was sworn in uh, in 2017, uh, but we saw that he's decided to um, conduct rallies in the middle of a global pandemic where we've had over 120,000 Americans die uh, because of coronavirus. Uh, we've seen many of his supporters say that they've had family members and friends die, but they don't care uh, because either they're divinely protected or they know that, you know, this is worth it and they just won't get it because the president has told them that uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe there's some calculuses that they're making that because Black and Latinx folks are disproportionately affected, they don't feel as though they'll be harmed in the same way. But we know that he's go he needs these rallies, right? Or at least he needed them because we saw him getting off the plane at one o'clock in the morning after the rally and he definitely looked dejected. What should we be thinking about until we meet again in two weeks? Uh, Lincoln, I'll start with you and then, and then Matt. Last time, we keep saying this is the moment where there are gonna be fissures in the cult-like support for Donald Trump within the Republican Party. I don't think it is, but it's more likely now than ever. Okay, ooh, okay. And Matt, what do you think? We, we have to figure out how people are going to vote in November. You saw massive issues with mail-in voting in November uh, in New York this week. You saw massive issues in Kentucky with people trying to get to the polls. That is going to be the single biggest problem heading into November, and Democrats need to figure out how people are actually going to be able to vote. Well, gentlemen, I cannot wait to talk to you in two weeks. Let's promise, I will put this on my calendar, we will talk about absentee ballots, we will talk about mail-in voting, and the United States Postal Service and the, and the conversations about defunding USPS just in time for an election where we might see a record number of Americans needing to vote by mail. So that's all the time we have. Thank you all both so much for being here with me. I'm Dr. Christina Greer. You all have been watching the election show on MNN. Thank you, Matt McDermott, communication strategist and vice president of Whitman Insight Strategies. And also thank you, Lincoln Mitchell, political analyst and professor of political science at Columbia University. You all have a great, great summer.